so our next section is Dr. Vandenberg, our very own um, doctor here at the Parkinson's Institute. Uh, she joined the Parkinson's Institute in 2006 as a clinical director. She has nearly 20 years of experience caring for patients with Parkinson's disease and related disorders. She's committed to ensuring that all patients and family members leave with every question answered. And although we're only picking a few today, I've personally seen her in previous events thoroughly answering uh, patients' questions and really trying to help them seek answers. So I'm pleased to present to you Dr. Brandenburg. Thank you. Unfortunately, I don't have unlimited time to answer questions because I've got patients waiting for me downstairs. But I'll try to get through a few of these questions. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. So some of these questions are going to be very dependent on a particular patient because not everybody has the same issues. So this one is, as Parkinson's disease progresses, what issues should the caregiver be mindful of? And there are a lot of things that you need to think about as Parkinson's progresses, and it'll vary from patient to patient. So the motor symptom that causes the most concern generally over time is um, difficulty walking and falling, and then something called freezing, where people try to move their feet and the feet sort of stick to the floor. And those are some of the most frustrating symptoms, and they're symptoms that the medication doesn't always help with. And they're also the ones that can potentially threaten a person's independence. So um, these are very bothersome symptoms. Mobility is very important, obviously. And falling is a terrible thing to happen, especially if you break things like your hip. So a hip fracture is a really devastating thing to happen to anybody, but especially somebody with Parkinson's disease. Uh, because what happens is that you usually have to have surgery to repair it, then you're on bed rest, so you're not exercising and moving around, then your mobility is compromised, you might get narcotics, so you might tend to be groggy or unsteady on your feet. It's just a, a sort of a spiral of doom, so if you can avoid a hip fracture, that's why I always harp so much on things like using walkers, using gait assist device, using a wheelchair when it's time for that, um, because if you say, oh no, I'm gonna tough it out and I'm not gonna use any of that stuff, then you're gonna be at greater risk for a hip fracture. And then the other thing that's really important for avoiding falls is exercise, exercise, exercise. And in fact, there's another question about what can, what can we do to keep our minds sharp? They're, you know, doing Sudoku puzzles and things like that seem like they would be really good for keeping your mind sharp, but in fact, the thing that is shown over and over again in the studies that helps memory is exercise, physical exercise. And we don't know all of the reasons for that, but for example, if you exercise, A, your overall health is better. B, it promotes blood flow to the brain. C, it promotes um, uh, antioxidant type therapies, like getting rid of free radicals that cause damage in the brain, inflammatory damage. Uh, it keeps other things under better control, like heart disease or diabetes. All of these things promote good, good health and good care. We all have to exercise whether we have Parkinson's disease or not. Um, but I've heard some really lame ones, like, I get plenty of exercise walking from the front of my house to the back of my house. That's another good one. Like, therefore, I don't have to exercise. So my mother can't exercise. She uses a walker. It's another really lame one because there are plenty of exercises you can do even if you're using a walker um, or in a wheelchair or anything. Like I, my, I can't exercise because I have poor balance. You can do seated exercises. There, there are tons and tons of different DVDs and things for seated exercises. I've heard I don't have the right kind of chair in my apartment to do seated exercise. I mean, if, if, you know, if you, there's an excuse for exercising, for not exercising, you, I've probably heard it. But there is no excuse, and there's, everybody has to exercise. It helps basically everything. So that's the physical thing that we're concerned about. The other thing that can be very concerning and is likely to land people in care facilities because the caregiver cannot handle them at home are behavioral things. So, so there's another question here about somebody getting kind of belligerent and being in denial. That's the kind of thing when somebody's judgment is affected and they're not able to effectively participate in their care 
and help make good decisions about their care, that can be a really difficult thing for families to negotiate. Because, and fortunately, most Parkinson's patients don't get like this. Most Parkinson's patients are quite conscientious and they will recognize when it's time to, say, give up driving or move to a facility where you can get additional assistance or have someone come in to help. Um, but some people are not and they fight, fight you every step of the way, which is just exhausting for a caregiver. And the other thing that's been shown to be a really, um, a really good predictor of when somebody's going to be placed in a care facility is hallucinations. Because hallucinations um, can be frightening, they can ca come along with paranoia and other behavioral symptoms, and that can be really, really hard to manage at home. Uh, especially if the, if the patient is con if accusing the spouse of infidelity, and, and one guy once who was going and knocking on the neighbor's door and accusing him of having an affair with the spouse, and as far as I know, she wasn't, but you know, you never know. But um, <laughs> there was a, a really sad case um, in California a few years ago. It was right after I first moved out here where somebody with Parkinson's who obviously had cognitive issues and hallucinations thought the neighbors were doing something bad to him. So he apparently threw a Molotov cocktail through that window and burned their house down and then got arrested for arson. And then they were going to try to make the family pay for the care facility that he ended up in um, after, after being found guilty by reason of, ins or not guilty by reason of insanity. So this can be a really big problem. And so hallucinations, if they start to happen, you have to let the doctor know right away because a lot of times they're treatable, but um, if you just let it escalate, it can really get out of hand. I had one lady who was trying to stop the hallucinations by beating them with a two by four. Only the problem with that is that she thought they were in her bed and her husband was in bed next to them. So here she is whacking at her pillow with a two by four while her poor husband's in bed. You know, so fortunately he didn't end up with a skull fracture. But these, these sounds, you know, seeing a little, a little of this and a little of that doesn't sound like it's that devastating, but it really can be. So those are some of the issues. Um, bladder issues, incontinence is another one that's very difficult. For some families just do fine with it. Yep, yeah, he's wearing a Depends now and we have a commode at the bedside. And some people just struggle and struggle and cannot manage to, to make that work. So um, bladder care issues. Bladder care issues, not everybody with Parkinson's gets them. For, not, not everybody with Parkinson's fortunately gets any of these things. Um, many, many people go on and live a full life without getting any of these things, thankfully. Um, but some people do develop them. What is the difference between and this, this kind of leads up to it. What's the difference between Parkinson's generated, generated dementia, Parkinson's dementia and Alzheimer's disease? So um, Parkinson's dementia is a condition where somebody's had Parkinson's usually for many years and they start developing cognitive changes that are significant. Um, memory problems, the Parkinson's patients tend to have more difficulty with retrieval um, than with storage. They usually are able to store the memory, but they have trouble bringing it back up when they need it. So those patients generally respond well to um, calendars and reminders and things like that. Um, and they tend to respond better to the Parkinson's, uh, to the memory drugs, the drugs that were originally developed for dementia, but we also use in Parkinson's disease. Whereas Alzheimer's patients tend to have more difficulty storing memories um, and so that when they go to retrieve them, you know, like, remember I told you we were going out to dinner tomorrow, there's no memory laid down in the first place. Whereas a Parkinson's patient, if you say, remember I told you we were going out to dinner, and, you know, we're going to try that new restaurant downtown, then they may say, oh, that's right, now that I have some clues, I can, I can retrieve that information, I can get it back out. Um, so in general, it's easier to manage somebody that has retrieval difficulties than someone that has storage difficulties. So the problem is that as bad as Parkinson's is, it doesn't protect us from getting Alzheimer's disease. So many people end up with both conditions, unfortunately. Just like anybody who's older has a risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. So it doesn't have, so it's not always one or the other. When people pass away and we look at their brain under the microscope, it often turns out that there are changes associated with both conditions. The only good thing about that is that the memory drugs we can use for either condition. 
It's not like if you're on a memory drug for your Parkinson's dementia, you're gonna miss out on the one for Alzheimer's because it's all the same medicine, basically. So um, what to do with it when a patient is uh, belligerent and in denial and won't take advice. So unfortunately with, as I said, most Parkinson's patients are very pleasant. They have good insight into what's going on. But sometimes, especially with some of the unusual things like uh, dementia with Lewy body disease or vascular dementias or frontotemporal dementias, people sort of lose that insight and their judgment is impaired. And so this makes it very, very hard to care for them at home because if you know the spouse is trying their best to keep them at home and keep everything going and keeping things comfortable, and you've got someone who clearly should not be driving and they're insisting on taking the car out and things like this, this they're not gonna be able to stay home very long. Uh, or if they're taking off their clothes and running around in front of the grandchildren or some of the other things I've had people do over the years, um, this is not conducive to keeping somebody at home, no matter how much the spouse uh, and everybody else in the family wishes to do that. It becomes very, very difficult. Um, what you can do about it, well, um, you can talk to the doctor about whether there's some medication that may help manage the symptoms. Um, you may try to get them in a safe place and let them have a kind of a cooling down period, but it doesn't usually help to kind of argue and use rational thinking and logic to talk them out of it, especially in the heat of the moment, because um, some of the things that happen, for example, the hallucinations, can be so realistic to the patient. The brain does an amazing job of creating these realistic images of bad people or, or threatening situations that it's really impossible and, and almost a waste of your energy to try to talk them out of it. Um, so mo most of my family members will sort of just try to change the subject, get onto something else, um, let the time pass, use whatever medications you have for this kind of thing um, to try to, you know, kind of get through the other, the next day. But it it's, can be very, very challenging, no doubt about it. Um, let's see. Person with Parkinson's has a weekly schedule that's different from the weekend schedule. Um, how does the change in times of when medication and intervals and so forth. Um, so basically, it's probably better to keep somewhat the same schedule of medications and activities during the week that you have on the weekend. And there are several reasons for that. One is that if you've got the medication working well on a, on a certain schedule, it's better not to tinker around with that because you may end up with taking fewer doses during the day or, or you know, at the end of the night you have one that you don't know what to do with. You get, it's okay to do once in a while, but I wouldn't do it on a regular basis. And the other problem with that is that most people with Parkinson's do have some type of sleep disorder. And if you are changing the sleep schedule drastically, that can cause some real problems. Better to, um, it was, there's a concept called good sleep hygiene. And that means your sleep habits should be consistent. You should be pretty much going to bed at the same time every night, getting up at the same time every day, um, if you nap, it should be no more than, say, half an hour at the same time every day. What happens a lot of times, especially if people develop cognitive problems, is that he have got one poor spouse caregiver running around like a chicken with their head cut off trying to keep the household running and get everybody to the doctor and get the medication prescriptions filled and get dinner on the table and keep the house in some kind of uh, order. And they cannot also stimulate that person all day long so that they don't doze in their chair. So it's better if you can find some way to keep the person stimulated during the day, like maybe with an adult day program or a caregiver who comes in to help them exercise or something like that so that you're not, you don't have this dozing in a chair situation. So with the weekend thing, better if you can not to make a big variation in the schedule. An hour or two is usually okay, but if you're normally getting them up at seven because you have to go to work and everybody's gonna sleep in until 11, that can very well kind of upset the apple cart, cause some disruption. Oh, foods that exacerbate PD symptoms. Um, this is an interesting one because I can think of several ways that this might happen. One would be if you're eating foods with a lot of caffeine late in the day, it could interfere with sleep. And people forget about hidden sources of caffeine and the reason I know about this is because these sources make a difference in me, and so I figure they probably make a difference in my patients. So, for example, I love chocolate, and there's nothing wrong with some dark chocolate. It's got antioxidants. It's basically good for you in moderation. 
Um, but if I eat it in the evening, I will have trouble sleeping if I eat a lot of it. So I tell people, I'm not telling you to give up chocolate, but have it for breakfast. And I'm totally serious. I'm serious. Why not? Why not? Breakfast of champions. So, um, and then things like green tea. There are some studies suggesting that green tea might be helpful in Parkinson's because it's got a lot of antioxidants and polyphenols and things. Um, but don't, it, it has caffeine. So don't drink your green tea in the afternoon and evening if you're having trouble falling asleep. Um, other sources, coffee ice cream, which is delicious, um, has ca a lot of it has caffeine in it. So you have to be really careful. Colas, um, some, some types of uh, soft drinks where you wouldn't expect it, like root beer sometimes has caffeine. So you have to look for hidden sources of caffeine. Um, other foods, if, if protein interferes with the way that the levodopa, the cinnamon, works, then you may have to readjust your uh, meal times to accommodate that. This is not the case for everybody. Um, some people can take their levodopa regardless of when they eat, and it doesn't make any difference at all in how their medication works. It's so that everybody preaches it like it's, it's written on a stone tablet, but, um, and for some patients it does make a big difference, but for a lot of patients it really doesn't matter when you have your meals uh, in relationship to your medication. The only way you can tell is if you have times when your medicine works pretty well and then other times when it doesn't, that's when you need to be taking a look at your protein load. And the other thing I've found is that a lot of people don't know what foods contain protein. So protein is found not only in beef, but in chicken, fish, um, peanuts, beans, or something like that. Um, all of those things have a lot of protein. There's a certain amount of it in cheese, in soy products. All of those things have protein. So if you find that protein interferes with your uh, the medication function, then you want to redistribute those things so you're not taking them right when you take your medication. So I think I see a lot of people sort of standing on their heads to adjust their medication times away from their food times, and most of, most people you don't really have to do that. It's only if it affects you in particular. Um, drinks that exacerbate PD symptoms. I heard an interesting thing from my patient the other day. He said that when that protein does seem to interfere with his medication working, but if he drinks uh, eight ounces of sparkling water, bubbly water of some kind, when he takes his medication, it seems to work better and faster regardless of whether he's eaten or not. So that's just something that doesn't hurt anybody to try that. People need more, generally need more fluids anyway. Getting dehydrated can definitely make your Parkinson's worse. It also makes you more prone to things like bladder infections, which can make your Parkinson's worse. Um, so staying hydrated is really, really important. It doesn't have to necessarily be water. Some people just can't drink water. But um, it should be something that's not like pure caffeine. Coffee will count as a fluid, but it's also a diuretic. But it can be juice. It can be iced tea if it's not too late in the day. It can be um, you know, any one of a number of things. It doesn't always have to be water. So it should be something you like so you will drink a lot of it. Milkshakes are good, especially if you're trying to put weight on. When, no, I mean, a lot of Parkinson's patients have trouble put, keeping weight on. And so then well, a lot of times I ask them, well, what sounds good to you? What do you feel like eating? And one lady told me, I like root beer floats. And I said, you can have a root beer float every day um, because that's something that appeals to her and she's having trouble keeping her weight on. So. But what about the protein level with that? Well, I don't think there's that much protein in a root beer float. Well, I mean in an ice cream float or in more. There's not that much in ice cream. What about what about something like um, Ensure? Well, I'm not wild about Ensure as a as a foodie no, <laughs> because it's chemicals. Because so thin. Well, if nothing else works, then you can use Ensure. But I would rather see. I would rather ask the patient, "What do you feel like eating?" and try to boost it up that way. With maybe make sure you're not getting. You know, some people are in the habit of buying skim everything and you know I'd rather see somebody getting a nice real root beer float with real ice cream than you know oh we've been buying this skim milk for a hundred years and we're still you know get full fat milk get full fat yogurt you know good, those are good quality foods um, but you know if yeah nothing else works you can do ensure but I just don't like the idea of substituting food with chemicals and if you're gonna do ensure don't do it with the meal because then they'll fill up on the ensure and they won't eat the fruits and vegetables and fish and the other good stuff, so. Okay, I think that's 
my time, right? I have to go downstairs and see a patient. So thank you all very much. <laughs>